I'm Fei Fei, and uh, um, I want to share with you something that uh, um, I have been devoting a lot of time on for the past seven years. Some of you might know my uh, my core research area is in computer vision and uh, and and machine learning. But for the past uh, seven years, I've been working very closely with Stanford School of Medicine, and uh, I feel very excited by the opportunity, and I want to share that with you. But to begin with, I think it's uh, um, no surprise to anybody here that we've really entered an AI era where AI is not only uh, one of the newest and most promising technology, but it's really a driving force to the transformation that our society is going through. But um, when we think about the AI revolution, one thing that truly, truly matters to many of us at Stanford here and in the community of AI is its human impact. No matter how exciting it is as a technical field, at the end of the day, it's a very, very um, it, it's a field that will touch everybody's life, work, and the collective future we share. And as Chris uh, introduced earlier uh, this morning, it is with this kind of realization and sense of opportunity and responsibility that Stanford uh, established the Human-Centered AI Institute about a year ago, but we formally publicly launched uh, just a little less than three weeks ago here, and some of you probably participated in our launch um, event, where we want to share with the world that Stanford is looking to um, open or usher in a new chapter of AI research where the focus is not only on um, continuing the proud tradition of the computer science and, and SAIL lab on um, AI technology, but also welcoming all disciplines and all, all kind of uh, uh, collaborations and, and studies about the impact and, and potential human-centered application of AI. So it's fair to say that this new chapter is uh, starting a new cross-disciplinary uh, area of AI that goes way beyond the walls and boundaries of computer science. And Chris already introduced the three principles of Stanford's Human Center AI Institute, the principle of uh, in, uh, um, developing the next generation AI technology by uh, being inspired by human intelligence, the principle of the need to study, anticipate, and guide AI's human and societal impact, and the principle of um, using and developing AI technology to augment and in, uh, enhance human capability. And it is this A principle, the augmentation and enhancement principle, that I want to be focusing on today. And one of the reasons I particularly want to talk, uh, share with you our work in, in, in under this, uh, um, this idea is that when we think about AI, when the media today talks about AI, um, the verb that is associated with this technology is not often enhancement or aug augmentation, but replacement. And uh, you can take a look at any reports out there, just take an example of a recent McKinsey report, and there is a lot of um, uh, predictions and assessment about um, how AI and automation might take over tasks and jobs that currently are performed by humans. And I think this is a really serious issue where we're collaborating with economists, the policymakers, to look at how um, we address the shifting landscape of labor market. And this is an issue that humanity has faced uh, many times as technology changes the way, um, the way labor is. Um, you know, just a few hundred years ago, that 95% of humanity was doing agriculture and look at the, the changes today. But while we look at how we understand and grasp the, the, the labor and, and job issue, I think technology can open a, also another opportunity for us. In fact, humans do a lot of tasks. And even within one job, there's many multi 
uh, uh, multi-dimensional um, ways of performing a job that is uh, um, involving many tasks. And if we look deeper, there's a lot of opportunity for a technology like AI that can enhance, assist, augment human uh, jobs instead of just replacing it. And I've spent the past seven years thinking about that in one area of research, which is healthcare. And to be very specific, it's healthcare delivery. It's the verb care in healthcare. And that's what I want to share with you. And this cannot possibly be done uh, without the collaboration of a wide range of talents from my colleagues and, and students in computer science and AI lab, as well as my colleagues uh, um, and collaborators at Stanford School of Medicine and our collaborating hospitals ranging from uh, Stanford to Utah's Intermountain uh, and so on. Um, I specifically want to thank uh, Professor Arnie Milstein, who le leads the, the Center for Clinical um, Excellence Research uh, at Stanford, who Arnie is a national leader in thinking about healthcare delivery, uh, uh, cutting down America's healthcare cost, as well as improving its quality. And speaking of that, I don't need to convince this audience that healthcare is America and many countries' top concern, both because of the sheer importance of this to human well-being, as well as the, the, the large amount of um, national resource and, and, and money it, uh, it uh, spends. And um, um, if you look at the different aspect of healthcare, from uh, drug discovery to medical imaging to uh, uh, medical devices to genomics, uh, the past few decades have been very exciting. A lot of uh, uh, progress have been made in all these different areas of healthcare. And many of them are starting to see the help of big data and machine learning to help improving computational genomics, uh, device, drug discovery, uh, reading uh, radiology reports, and so on. And we'll continue to see these advances, and I'm personally very excited by that. But, um, but there's one space, literally, no uh, pun intended, that is kind of not at the center of this uh, um, new change for, for at the beginning. And this is um, the physical space of healthcare delivery. Uh, why does physical space of healthcare delivery matter? It's because lots and lots of human activities happen there. In fact, if you think about the very core of healthcare, is about patients is about clinicians' interaction and help to our patients. It's about the interaction between family members, caretakers, clinicians, um, patients, and all the kind of complex behavior that's surrounding it. And that is a critical, critical part of healthcare. But when it comes to human behavior, um, it, is, it is not only complex, it also um, sometimes uh, introduces errors. In fact, um, there is a National Institute of Medicine report issued about 20 years ago that summarized really well um, the kind of potential pitfalls in healthcare delivery caused by human errors. And uh, um, if you've never read this book, I encourage you to get it on Amazon and read it. It's actually... Um, pretty scary when you read this book. And uh, here's an example that uh, um, the, the death per year caused by clinical errors far exceeds, uh, say, car accident, you know, traffic, uh, traffic fatality per year. And this is, you know, I mean, I don't need to convince you this is not only costly, but it really takes away a large number of human lives. And, uh, and where did these deaths uh, or fatality come from? It come from all kinds of sources. It's sometimes, in most cases, it's the intended clinical care 
that didn't take place in the process of healthcare delivery, whether it's um, uh, procedures in surgery or um, intended hand hygiene practice or patient safety related issues, something um, happens. And it's, it's oftentimes not intentional and, and oftentimes happens by accident. So for years and years and years, there has been a lot of uh, local um, remedies proposed and uh, used to um, try to reduce the kind of healthcare delivery er uh, errors, whether it's um, um, you know local mobility sensor or um, or um, you know tools to to uh, or, or to methods to track surgical process and all that. But the problem is that if you work in healthcare, you realize. Things are really complex. If we have a local solution or local sensor with a local alarm or alert to every potential pitfalls of healthcare delivery, we're soon going to be just only hearing beeps in, in the whole uh, delivery process. In fact, alarm fatigue is already a problem, unresolved problem in, in today's uh, um, clinical work. So um, what we um, started thinking about and working on in the past seven years with Stanford School of Medicine is to actually look at it in a, in a different way. Instead of thinking about local solutions, we're thinking about infusing AI and the, the kind of global awareness of the physical space and human behavior in the entire um, prevalent space of healthcare delivery rather than very local, you know, under the mattress or wearing a device or, and so on, very local solutions. And, uh, and uh, we call this the ambient intelligence in healthcare delivery that, that is intended to assist clinicians and patients. So this might sound a little, if you're not familiar with this idea, this might sound a little bit foreign or, or you know, it's just not something we, we hear a lot about. But I want to draw an analogy to a technology or application of AI that you're extremely familiar with right now. And seven, eight years ago, it was this technology or application that inspired me to walk over to the medical school and start talking about this idea with my uh, colleagues. And it's um, self-driving car technology. And uh, self-driving car technology has been around uh, for the past decade. It's one of the most exciting revolutionary idea that uh, we have seen in Silicon Valley um, um, in, the, in the recent years. And, and uh, I have to say Stanford is very proud to be one of the birthplace of self-driving car technology, especially with Sebastian Throne winning the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2006. And uh, why is self-driving car technology suddenly happening in the past 10 years? It's a combination of many things, of course, including maps and so on. But the advancement of, uh, of sensors, the advancement of algorithms are, are critical in making this technology um, possible and, and, and making self-driving car technology um, uh, realizing that dream. And the same sensors and the algorithms and the, the potential integration of them could be happening in healthcare. And that's what um, made Arnie and I so excited. We see a parallel story that can take place in, in healthcare delivery, just like self-driving car in transportation. Of course, there's a whole different landscape in terms of privacy, uh, regulation, and, and uh, I'm happy to talk offline. But this is the beginning, the inception of our idea. So the, the key ingredient in this ambient intelligence in, in hospital environment um, in, includes uh, sensors, the sen sensing capability, includes the capability to recognize and analyze human activities, and, uh, and fundamentally the holistic or integrated visual understanding of what's going on. And, um, and, 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 uh, and the, the holistic understanding. And it's these three ingredients 
that I want to be talking about today and um, and give you a little more details. So let's start uh, start with sensing. Um, so what is the kind of sensors we want to put in our healthcare uh, environment that would achieve our goal downstream? And again, even though we're inspired by self-driving car technology, it's a very different environment and it's going to be very different um, uh, from self-driving cars. The number one, we interviewed a lot of clinicians and patients, the number one requirement we should begin thinking about is privacy. This is a, an environment that is critically um, important to protect patient privacy, clinician privacy, family privacy. So we want to censor or we want to begin with using sensors that are very protective of human privacy. We also want to, you know, contrast to the, the local sensors some of uh, uh, the previous application have tried. We want something that is um, prevalent in space and time. So we don't want one sensor for one healthcare condition and another sensor for another healthcare condition. And... Um, and when you think about something that is prevalent in space, clearly vision is a really good choice. And uh, and sensing over time, this is the, the advantage of machines. They don't get tired as long as there's uh, power. So we uh, landed on a very cheap, mature technology called depth sensors. And uh, if you ever play Xbox, you know this is, uh, um, you know, connect is one of the the, the, the the very famous depth sensor, but there are many different kinds of depth sensors on the market now. And you'll see on your right, there's an example image taken by a depth sensor. And the nice thing about depth sensor is it doesn't show RGB information, therefore does not reveal human faces. And uh, that is a huge, a lot of clinicians and patients, when they see this kind of image, they feel great, uh, a sense of uh, release, a relief that um, that this is a, uh, a technology that uh, respects privacy. So we started collaborating with the Lucille Packer Children's Hospital and uh, Intermountain uh, Hospital in in Utah to put these sensors in the hospital inpatient wards. And every orange dot you see here is a sensor, depth sensor. Um, installed on the ceiling or on the wall, and uh, the arrow indicates the direction that the sensor is facing. And uh, and uh, here is uh, examples of data streaming from these depth sensors in uh, children's hospital at uh, Stanford. And you can see it's it's noisy, but you can clearly see signal of human activity coming out of these uh, these sensors, and. Uh, of course, we have to combat the issue of um, lots and lots of data because once we're starting to stream these uh, uh, sensors and, and multiple sensors 24-7, you get a huge amount of data. So my students did a lot of uh, clever tricks to try to contain the amount of data uh, without, um, um, without sacrificing the performance of downstream algorithms. So one thing I want to say is... Um, is that working in healthcare industry takes a lot of patience for technologists. Um, it took us, I think, almost four years to get the first bit of data streaming from sensors after working on um, HIPAA, on IRB, on, on, on passing through all the hoops. And I find my students extremely heroic, heroic in 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 in. Um, going through that, but it's also so important in interdisciplinary research that we um, we respect that and uh, we understand all the process and work very patiently uh, with these uh, colleagues in in hospitals who are really every day saving lives. So that's on the sensing side. The bulk of this talk, and um, Erica, you need to tell me how much time I have. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll, I don't intend to get through all the papers and it's not that important. I'll just share with you some of the applications and algorithms that we're developing um, along this. So let's talk, take a look at one um, problem, one set of problem in, in healthcare, and that's the problem hand washing or hand hygiene. And uh, why is this a problem? 
because it kills about ninety nine thousand lives in、uh, American hospitals per year, almost three times as the number of、uh, people killed in car accidents, and、uh, one in twenty admitted patients in the U.S. will、um, get infected with hospital acquired infection and. And that can be fatal, and this is a thirty dollar, a thirty billion dollar problem in the U.S. And the number is just as high in the、uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. So this is a huge problem: hospital acquired infection, and it mostly happens because clinicians go from room to room, and there's a lot of bacteria that they carry. So there are, you know, the World、uh, Health WHO World Health Organization has a set of protocols to practice hand hygiene. But it's really hard to remember if you ever,、uh, you know, observe how clinicians work or worry the hospital. You'll see how busy they are. So hospital try to combat this problem. So for decades, the way to combat this problem is actually a fairly medieval solution. Of sending a human secret shopper or a couple of human secret shoppers to stand at the corner of a hospital ward with a clipboard and and just check and see if if clinicians perform、um, hand hygiene practice、uh, hand hygiene、um, uh, protocol when they enter patient room or about to touch patients, and this is obviously very flawed. It is very sparse. It is time-consuming. It's costly. It has all kinds of human biases and so on. So、um, we started collaborating with Stanford Children's Hospital to propose that we can use sensors to help monitor health,、uh, hand hygiene practice twenty-four-seven with very、um, very objective、uh, measurement, and、uh, that's what we set out doing. At、uh, at Stanford,、um, one thing. Oh, sorry. One thing that excites me as a technologist when I work in、um, healthcare space is that not only the application is tremendously important, the technical opportunities are abundant. A lot of the problems we need to solve in healthcare are not solved by today's. Say computer vision algorithms. There's a lot of challenges that can come back and inspire us to come up with better algorithms that can be applicable in all kinds of settings beyond healthcare. So, for example,、um, just to name a few challenges,、um, of course, learning complex human activity behavior is itself an unresolved computer vision problem. Then there is this unusual、um, uh, sensor viewpoint. Because in healthcare condition, that we have to make sure the sensors are out of the way for much more critical equipments and, and human activities, and that、um, uh, resulted in、um, in very unusual angles for uh, for um, for where the data is captured, and that's a, another interesting technical opportunity. And of course, humans in in health.、Uh, Delivery situation go across many many sensors, and how do we combine the tracking of one in individual cross sensors is another is another um, um, challenge. So、um, we collected a lot of data. This is to just show you this bar plot is to just show you that we collected more data than any other data、uh, data sets in in in, in、um, published work, and then.、Um, We used a deep learning algorithm to identify the complex behavior of hand、uh, hand washing, and this is a result to show you that、um, we have very high sensitivity and specificity, which means we have very high accuracy in、uh, in machines identifying hand hygiene behavior. And the the the、uh, heat plot you see, the very bottom row is. Ground truth labeled by human clinicians watching、um, the videos of of this ninety roughly ninety minutes in a in a, a by by a sensor, and then the our algorithm is the second to the last row. You can see it's very similar to the ground truth, but the top three rows are human observers'、um, performance. You can see that um, um, single human、uh, observer just. Miss a lot of events, whereas、uh, 
when you uh, triangulate four human observers, things go a lot better, but it's still not as good as machines. And also, this is just not a scalable uh, kind of method to use humans. And here's just some um, visualization of uh, the heat map showing the algorithm recognizing hand hygiene um, behavior. And um, I'm going to um, advance some slides. Um, in order to address the, the viewpoint problem, we, uh, um, we did another algorithm that does the, the spatial um, uh, transformation uh, of, the, of, the, of the videos in order to, to um, correct the, the, the um, unusual viewing angles. So I'm going to just uh, skip. And this is a result to show you our algorithm is able to detect human postures using these kind of depth data, even in unusual angles. Um, and uh, let me just show you. Here is a heat map generated by using a tracking technology we developed um, to, to show you in a hospital ward, all the behaviors of clinicians. Um, sorry, I can't see. Okay, all right. So that's the hand hygiene um, example. I'll show you two other areas of research without getting into the depth of it. One is ICU. ICU takes one percent of the entire GDP. And there's, this is where life and death happens the most in a hospital. And in the ICU, there is a lot of activities. And patient safety is one of the number one thing in, in, um, in uh, ICU activities. And uh, because of the state of the ICU patients, there is there's this competing needs of wanting to keep patients safe as stable in the ICU bed, but also want to encourage them to have movements, sometimes with the aid of clinicians, but sometimes by themselves, so that their potential recovery is faster. So patient mobility is encouraged, while patient safety has to be maximally secured. So there's this competing needs to, to which result into a need to watch our patients carefully, 24-7. And nurses do that, but they cannot possibly do that all the time. They have so many other tasks. So I'm just going to advance. And um, this is an algorithm we are developing in the ICUs to really densely annotate and watch uh, patient and clinical behaviors. And this is a very new area of computer vision, especially video analysis of dense human behavior recognition. And I'm very excited. I'm just you, with all these attention models in LSTM and all that. I just want to say that um, we are making progress in, in this particular area and have some of the first papers written about uh, watching ICU patient mobility. And um, without telling you the details, one last area we're working on is aging. Aging is a, a worldwide problem, and we have so many, um, uh, we're going to see more and more seniors. And one of the top goal of aging is to encourage and, and, and in, ensure um, um, independent living for our seniors. But we want to prevent bad things like falling. Falling, seniors fall is, again, another multi-billion dollar problem that cause a lot of lives. And we're working with uh, senior homes in San Francisco right now to look at how we can use sensors. Here we actually use multimodal sensors, depth sensor and thermal sensor to help monitor uh, the, 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 the conditions and, and behavioral changes of our seniors and, uh, and, and to ensure their, um, their safety and quality of living. So with that, I'm just going to conclude, and this is the beginning of uh, a, a, a going to be a long-term research, and it's also an area that is very underexplored, and I will be very excited to see more and more people working in this area and, and using AI to, to help in improving healthcare delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Do we have um, a few questions before our break um, on this? Oh. 
Thank you. I'm uh, Reddy Goodluck from Anthem, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, the question I have for you is, uh, with respect to the practical application, especially the uh, sensors, um, uh, hand hygiene, so who is the target user here? How do we expect the hand hygiene routine to be improved? So Either the, the hospitals or the members? Yeah, the, the question is for hand hygiene, who is the target user and what is the, how do we change behavior? The target users are clinicians. And there is an ongoing uh, uh, project that's going on between AI, uh, medical school, as well as our human computer interaction, HCI faculty, James Landy, whom I think you'll hear from this afternoon about how we send back signals to our clinicians through uh, clever um, you know, iPad reminders uh, on patient bed and, uh, and, and, and make sure before they touch patients, they are reminded with this kind of uh, uh, signal. But in general, it's the clinicians that we're targeting at. Uh, hi, uh, right here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Professor oh, okay. Lee? Hi. Yes. Hi. My name is Suyash. I work at Oracle. My question is regarding the, so it's interesting that you're using the ASUS camera to do the depth uh, capture. What's the state of art for detecting uh, objects and tracking, especially emotion, like with the 3D point cloud data uh, in computer vision? State of the art, um, well, uh, first of all, you're asking state of the art in uh, depth image, not in RGB, right? Uh, yeah, so the state of the art in tracking depends on the condition, right? If you're looking, you're, if you're tracking cars, then it's really good, you know, to the point of deployment as products. But if you're tracking tiny surgical tools, you know, we, we have begun a collaboration with um, Stanford uh, Surgery Department where it's not tracking scissors, it's tracking these tiny, tiny um, hooks. I don't even know the, the technical uh, terms for these tiny surgical tools, like uh, uh, bent needles, I guess. They look like hooks. Um, I, I, we're, we're pretty far from that. So um, so it really depends on the depend on the, the actual objects and the environment. You're, if you're tracking those needles in bloody environment with lots of uh, occlusion, it's an unsolved problem. Professor? Here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I'm Harpreet from UST Global. The question Can I have is... Can you please speak louder? Yeah. So I'm Harpreet from UST Global. The question is that you said that uh, the observers for hand hygiene were not able to do a better task and the algorithm was able to do it. So I just wanted to know what methods you use to actually estimate the ground truth because the observers are not themselves able to predict, predict that, right? So. so I vaguely heard you ask how we measure ground truth, right? Yes. Yes. So the ground truth is we have videos of the of the um the sensors right? right and then we have clinicians trained clinicians multiple clinicians look at the videos coming out of the sensors offline and mark um hand hygiene events okay 